Okay, new entry. Where are you, new entry? Where are you? Ah. While gathering what they've found, Ashton accidentally brought up Isabel's father, who had apparently passed away the day before. Suddenly, her reasons for trying to fix this mess became clear to him. In his attempt to comfort her, he ended up almost admitting something he's not ready to put into words. Oh, uh, over here as well. To confirm their suspicions, Isabella helped Ashton break into the Briar Realty Corporation's Luxborn office that night. It's not like they really broke in, though. There, the files they found revealed the re real deal with the mansion sale that was unknown to even Isabella. Something possible, and something possibly more terrible. Is there more? Is that it? Oh, that was it. Uh, hastily, I gather everything. The personnel files. Cat, stop chewing on wires. You're adorbs, but my goodness. Personnel files, client documents, sales agreements, and contracts, anything my hands could reach. In record time, all of it has been stacked in a neat pile, ready for storage. I'm heading for the records room not a few seconds later. Wherever that is, it should be an easy find, unless this place is a maze of some sort, which I highly doubt. Still beats staying here and seeing the look on her face. Crap. Really, her anger is still bearable. I can take that, including the glower she sends my way. So, uh, yeah, I'll <sighs> I'll go get the security videos and put these back where you pulled them from. Man, these these are heavy, you know. Ash, it's just paper. You don't even know where I. Oh pff, no, I can I can handle this, easy as pie. And uh, yeah, security cams, tapes, videos, cams. Da, da, da. Yeah, I'm off. Her rejection at this point. Maybe. Maybe not yet. Da, da, da. Getting the files back to BRC's archive room is a cinch. With the documents back in their proper places, I lock the door behind me, tugging it twice just to make sure. Now on to the next order of business. Removing the evidence of our little excursion in here, or at the very least, the parts showing what we've been doing during the past hour. Can't have our faces plastered on security footage showing us breaking the law, as it were. I'm gonna have to wipe the data for Isabella's uh, access card entries, too. Surprisingly, finding their security room proves a breeze. What will be tricky is getting inside. The fact that no one has walked out during the whole time we've been here means the room is either empty or their security... Uh, sound asleep. I'm banking more on the former. If they're cutting corners and firing agents, I have no doubt that they've fired the guy stationed here, if they have anyone watching the monitors in the first place. It's a rather common thing for establishments, just leave security recording indefinitely and only check the footage if something actually happens. Just to check, I press my ears against the door, listening for a sign of anyone occupying the room. After a long minute and nothing, I give the do uh, the knob a few rattles. Standard lock and key. Should be easy enough to pick. We have lockpick sets, but those are only to be used if necessary and with a search warrant. Even then, it's a skill set rarely needed. Subtlety isn't on a cop's priority if they have authority to search the premises. Bolt cutters and brute force are the favored methods. If those fail, we call a locksmith. Me, I prefer the old hairpin trick when those options aren't available. Besides, they're easy to hide and store for emergencies. Running my hand through my hair, I pull a pair of bobby pins. Okay. Two of these, and I can just open about any... Open up... <laughs> I can just about open any standard lock. One makes a lever, and the other makes a handle. I won't call it a complex skill, but it certainly takes time and a lot of practice to successfully pick a lock. Good thing I've practiced with them for a bit in my college years. I learned more when they're accessible and standard issue for a law enforcement officer. Standard issue bobby pins. Wiggle here. I click there and I manage to seize all the pins in the locking mechanism soon enough. The slight turn of the knob, the security room's ripe for the picking. Uh-oh. The room's odor hits me first, a sharp, nause nauseating stench, as if someone has accidentally spilled a gallon of bleach in this room, or was murdered. When was the last time they opened this place? Ugh, this place smells awful. Jesus, it's worse than the forensics lab on a bad day. 
dead body! This is probably because of badly botched attempt to clean the place up. Even in the dark, I can spy spark dark stains on the walls. Really don't have time to try and play is this ketchup or soda right now, but I have the strange gut feeling who the mess might belong to. As expected, no security personnel mans the office's CCTV controls, and the standalone DVR setup is open for anyone. Normally I'd have a heap of things to say about this sloppy security setup, but right now their negligence makes the whole task of erasing evidence easier. No fuss, no muss. The next one should be the access card data. Hopefully getting into their computer won't be too much of a hassle. Everything up to now has been smooth sailing. There have been hiccups, I'll give it that, though it does nothing to dampen the good mood I'm in. Once I shift my attention to the machine sitting next to the DVR setup, all of it swiftly evaporates. I am no computer buff, but I can definitely recognize one more than a decade old. Simply looking at it makes me feel younger. With a heavy sigh, I power it up and mentally prepare myself for slow slug. Slow, apparently, remains an understatement here. It takes a whole three minutes for the thing to start up. The OS hasn't even started loading, and in my boredom, I start inspecting the live feeds from the cams. Only two works, one for the view outside, everything seems to be in order there, and the other for main workspace where... It's a fleeting glimpse, a cursory glance, but a sight of it stops me. The image is a bit blurry. Uh-oh. Isabella! Isabella, run! She's here! She killed the security guard, now she's coming for... You and Ashton. Uh, but standing there, right in the middle of the room, by one of the cubicles, I can make out the form of a... What the hell is... I don't get too far into that line of thought. No few seconds after my words have slipped out, without any sort of warning, I'm still trying to make sense of what it is. The figure moves. Oh, that is so creepy. I love it. I love creepy things on cameras. Oh, God. That face. <laughs> Look at that face. The moment of paralysis hits me when she stops right in front of the camera like a damn rookie. I go still in the face of danger. I definitely haven't been trained to handle the supernatural in this one, isn't it? And... Oh. Oh, F that. Her eyes bore into me. Her ghost-like eyes. <laughs> yeah, the malice in them piercing even beyond the screen. It's enough to make me go numb. Only the mug crashing to the floor or when my hand accidentally takes a swipe at it. Snaps me out of the trance and reminds me that I'm not the only one here. Isabella. Isabella, it's behind you. It seems she hasn't noticed anything. Am I the only one seeing this? In any case, whatever's happening, I have to get her out. Oh, jeez. Ashton, your phone. <laughs> Gathering my wits, I quickly reach for my phone, which won't work. It takes but all two seconds before she answers, and there's no time for relief. Ashton? Did you really have to call? We're practically on the same floor. Get out of there. What? what? Out. Get out. I'll meet you in the elevator. Just... You're creeping me out, Ash. Just get yourself out of that place. Now! Without second thought, I back away from the controls, from the room ready to be done with this place. But before my foot even moves, she disappears. Son of a- Oh! Right through the monitor! Oh, and she's all s I don't know, what is that term? She's- she's got glitter all over her. <laughs> Instinct instantly takes over. My hand quickly reaches for the gun at my side, because you're just gonna shoot a ghost! <laughs> yes! Shoot the ghost, Ashton! Shoot it! Shoot her! Only to meet empty air. Oh. A mistake that cost me a few precious seconds while the paperwork I've brought with me threatens to scatter everywhere. At the same time, cat, you've f fallen out of my lap. I, I hope this isn't going to be a quick time event. Uh, gathering everything in myself once more with no weapon to protect myself, my sense of self-preservation kicks in next and I lunge towards the door. I sprint across the office without daring to look back. Isabella is already waiting in front of the elevators by the time I make it out of their office. Uh-oh, he didn't get the... He didn't get the, the... the tapes? Rory creases her eyebrows upon glancing at me, but I don't have time to answer the question in her eyes. As soon as I reach her, I grab her arm, practically throw the two of us into the open elevator, and slam the button for the ground floor.
sigh of relief escapes from me when the elevator starts its descent. The clicking noise fades off into the distance. Besides, beside me, Isabella shifts, moving the stack of papers under her arm while she takes in my appearance. I hope he finally talks about what he saw. The fact that they don't talk to each other, they're just like, you're crazy, is, is pissing me off. Concerns in her eyes, though all I offer her is a small gesture of my hand while I attempt to compose myself and not talk about the apparition. <sighs> Breathe. In, out. In, out. Stroke. Why are we in such a hurry? We, we need to get out of this place. Did you get everything? Yeah, it's all here. But really, you, you don't look too good. What's wrong, Ash? Why is she acting like this? Why, what, what, considering what she's seen, wouldn't she be like, did you see it? Did you see the apparition? Was it in there? But no, she's like, what's going on? You're weird. I'll be fine. Just, I was in the security room. There's, from the monitors, there was a fucking... Uh, the rest of what I'm about to say dies in my tongue when the elevator stops and the door's open too. The parking garage? There's a moment's pause while we both take in our surroundings. Confusion's understandably there. Uh, except for this building didn't have a parking garage. Oh, come on! They should just replace this whole thing! No. No, I'm quite sure I pressed for the ground floor. Right? It's just as Isabella said. The elevator it always did have problems when I visited in the past. Often she becomes so angry whenever we try to get to her floor, and she'll have to repeatedly smash the button for the elevator to even move. That was always good for a laugh. I wasn't too worried then, but now... Oh, gods. Where is she going to come from? From the distance, beyond the light's reach, the noise echoes in my ears, along with a rapid pounding in my chest. Isabella stiffens and her eyes grow wide at the sound. Gingerly, she re reaches up to grab the hem of my sleeve and grips it hard enough, tight enough, for her fingernails to dig through. Her eyes searches wildly for the source of the sound while I stand protectively in front of her. Ash, did you hear that? If he says no, I'm going to be furious. Anyone there? Yeah, there's someone there. I can hear you moving from here. Show yourself. You know it's the apparition, dude. No response. No response, only the soft sound of something scurrying around the floor and walls and slow, deliberate movements. Faint, though still audible enough in this hush. Okay, cat, you're gonna take a second whack at staying in my lap until you slip out again? Until it stops. A moment. We need to go, Ash. We have to. Start hitting buttons, Isabella. And then... Uh-oh. This time, I'm certain it isn't my imagination. Please no quick time events. Against my training, my whole body freezes. Hands still mid-press on the button, eyes growing wide while waiting for any sort of movement from further back, and the ears strained for the source of the sound. If I have to mash buttons, I'm gonna be screwed. Can't even offer Isabel any reassurances. Much as I hate to admit it, dread has seeped into every nerve in my body. And the blasted elevator won't, still won't move. Won't work. This isn't in my fucking training manual! <laughs> Ash, Ash, we need to leave. I know that sound. Ash, please, get the elevator! Another series of shuffling against the ground, a laughter, and all of a sudden, she's just there! Like a twisted spider, she stares at us, a look of hunger in her eyes and venom in the twisted manner, she smiles. A glee she has er well earned when we're damned flies have been dropped right onto that spider's web. Ashton! Damn it! Damn it! Without warning, why, why don't we get this here? She moves, mocking me with each unhurried crawl she takes, knowing I'm at her mercy. I want to see this. Fucking hell! Or is this gonna be the quick time of it? God damn it. Ashton, the door! The door! Our lives are in the hands of a crummy elevator, literally hanging between life and death. We're not going to die here. Not in a damn elevator. Oh, oh, oh shit. Six, three, two, four, eight. Holy shit, oh, uh, three, eight, no, four, eight. Shit, cat out of eight, five, two, three. Oh, no, three, six, nine, seven, four, no. Cat 
in the lap. I had a cat in the lap. And for some reason, the numpad doesn't work. <sighs> Let's try that again. Not in the damn elevator. Okay. Five, eight, three, nine, four. Uh, eight, six, one, two, seven. One, four, eight, three, nine. <laughs> six, five, seven, three, two. Two, nine, five, seven, one. Damn it. Oh, press tab to skip. Not in a damn elevator. <laughs> I need to just skip that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I panicked too much. Uh, as if a divine power has heard me swearing up a storm in my head. But no, cat, please. I know. I know. The door's closed just as that thing looms near. Let me move the keyboard at least. I have no... Uh, no power over this cat wanting in my lap. Uh, soon the elevator, the blasted thing, is headed up. Isabella's knees buckle in relief, and two ticks she's hugging herself without any care for the mess of papers and folders she has dropped on the floor in her panic. She draws in one ragged breath after another, each one brimming with nothing but relief. And this... This is the most I've been tired my whole damn life. Not during training, when my superior first asked me to drop a hundred, not after a stakeout. But after smashing a, a elevator button repeatedly. It wasn't one, it was several. It's like you had to enter in a code to get that thing to work. Uh, I slumped to the ground beside her, worn out, but I don't let myself feel relief again. Not until we're out of here. Isabella seems to be the same mind as she looks to me. Still, I find myself sharing a shaky laugh with her. <laughs> we're... we're okay. We're fine. Hey, if you can... if you can laugh after something like that, bravo. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Alive. Fuck, we should have taken the goddamn stairs. <laughs> Twice I've seen it. Thrice, if I include the party, unless I'm tripping balls without realizing it. There's no doubt in my mind that this is actually happening. I don't want to believe it. But with the truth staring at me in the face, it'll be stupidity to deny the reality of the matter. I think that was the first time that two people have seen her at the same time. Ah. As soon as the lift hits the ground floor, we hightail it out of the building. Seb's sound asleep when we pass by a station. However, in the face of what we've seen, everything I've faced tonight, we really can't care less who will still see us on our way out. The sooner we get away from this place, the farther, the better. I'm just not sure if that also means being safe. She almost got us, damn it. That fiend thing almost got us. Shit, it was only by luck that we managed to, <laughs> and skipping the QTE, to get the effing elevator unstuck. Had the blasted thing not worked in the last second? I need some fresh air. Fresh, breathable air that doesn't stink like death and gore and bleach all at once. I'm panicking. Christ, losing focus with another person here. Can't afford that right now. Isabella hasn't said anything, but I know she's more shaken than I am. Can't lose it when another person's depending on me. Remember your training, Frey. <sighs> another deep breath and soon I'm starting the engines and driving us off. After that little incident, somewhere open would be good. Someplace I won't get trapped in an elevator. Like the park. Luxborn par Park brings a welcome relief, though only by some. The chill that has seeped in my bones is still there, furling and unfurling underneath my skin. If I don't move, if I don't busy myself with anything, soon my brain will go haywire. It's the last thing I want to ha want to happen when there are plenty of things to do. But this, is all, but this already answers all of it, doesn't it? Those deaths? Just how many copies of the letter are out there? Isabella can't have the only one if other people are also getting cursed. Could it be that the one she has shown us is just one of five? Perhaps even more? That whole pass this to five people business is ridiculous. Oh, someone else might have passed it, huh? But at this point, is it still? All in all, we found 21 people who might have read the letter, seven of them deceased. Eight, if we count Cooper. And that's only with what we can find right now. We have no idea how the contractors and specialists hired from outside the company are doing. If we are in any way affected, if if we are in any way affected, or what about they? How many more people are suffering? How many are missing? How many are 
dead. Can I still even blame the rites for this? If anything, they might be in danger as well. I don't think I can wish a curse upon anyone, no matter how big of a douchebag Luke Wright is. There's also that woman. How do we get out of this mess? How do we get away from here? Her. Shit. Still so many things we need to look into. Yet all my body wants to do is pace, burn out whatever excess energy there is in me. Ashton, I'm getting dizzy. Will you sit down? It's the first time Isabella has said anything. She's been sitting quietly since we dropped here. Better and less distracting than watching her nervous habits, I suppose. She certainly seems calm now. Too calm, in fact, for someone who has just seen something terrible. But it's been more than a week for her already. People do get desensitized to things at some point. Even someone like Isabella, who knows what's going on inside her head, though. Inside mine, there are too many, and none of them would sit still. I'm not going crazy, am I? I saw that. I'm pretty sure I saw that. I didn't inhale anything weird. Just shit. Shit, 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 shit! Isabella, please tell me that wasn't... What I'm not expecting when I turn to her is mirth, one that she could barely contain. You're laughing. You're laughing. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what she sees in my face, but in the next second a laugh suddenly bursts out from her. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's just that you should have seen the look on your face back there. Yes, right, sure. I'm not the one who's panicked. You almost ripped my arm off. Wow, that recording. <laughs> yeah, but... Isabella, this isn't funny. We could have ended up dead. I know, I'm really sorry. But this is just too precious to miss. You really lost your shit for a moment there. You're trying to get back at me, aren't you? Well, I'm not the one who kept calling someone scaredy cat for years. <laughs> How does it feel? I'm not scared. Really? Because it doesn't seem that way to me. At all. I'm not, alright? I'm just... I... I just don't know what to do right now. Immediately after, the moment passes, replaced by another tense silence. Laughter dies in her lips as everything sinks in. We're in deep shit and has finally caught up and hit us like a ton of bricks. Hit me more than anyone. Because she has been warning us of this since day one, and I'm the first person who brushed it off. Despite that, she still reaches out to me, tugging at my sleeve almost desperately. Her hands are trembling, and there's a tremor in her voice when she speaks. Without the cheer, only fear remains. One that she has been burdened with from the beginning. We're still going to do something about it, right? Not just stand around and let that thing get us. Unexpectedly, she leans her forehead against my arm, and her grip on my sleeve tightens. There's a desperation in there, a quiet plea. I don't want to lose anyone anymore, Ash. I wish I could give her that promise, but with so many unknowns, so many things I don't understand about this, how could I? Why she still trusts that I can do something about this baffles me. It all feels woolly undeserved, considering the way I've treated her. Yet, despite my reluctance, I find myself returning her hold in kind. A grasp, warm and light enough for comfort. Not a promise, but the closest thing to it. Dot dot dot. October 30th, Sunday. More dot dot dots. Darkness blurs the edges of my vision. Black tendrils twist and coil around my limbs. Soft footfalls echo from the far distance, scurrying, scampering, moving in an odd rhythm with the sharp, piercing notes of her laughter. A scream threatens to burst, but my throat closes off. Ever so slowly, a chill seeps into every nerve in my body, washing away every sensation in me, apart from one. There is only fear. <laughs> Once again, her laughter echoes, a sound both bitter and unforgiving. It is the last thing I hear before she reaches for me. The ground trembles. The world slows to a stop. <gasps> oh, what happened here? Morning breaks in a blurry mess of vivid shapes and colors. Oddly, there's no feeling of terror or confusion gripping me, despite the vague images that has driven me from sleep. Bat-cat! 
Awareness kicks in shortly, though slow and sluggish as I blink away the last remnants of unconsciousness from my eyes. The early morning light already streams from the open windows when the memory sets in and the room finally comes into focus. Isabella's apartment. Pushing myself upright, my eyes wander idly towards her prone form. Oh gods. Cat jumping. Off of lap. Didn't rip the headphones off me. She's hunched over the coffee table, both her arms under her head while she continues to rest. Then to the chaos of papers and folders we've left scattered over before sleep has claimed both of us. We've bunkered down here last night after both our nerves have calmed down. Mine, for the most part, staying together was an unspoken invitation. And anyway, I'm pretty sure neither of us wants to remain alone when there's that, that woman there. But what about the others? Is she still one in the first place? One that we'd normally call a human? Can it still feel guilt? Does it understand pain? Fuck. I'd rather get charged for breaking and entering than mess with whatever that thing was any day. Not that thinking about this matters when all our lives are in our hands. She's dangerous. If we don't do anything about her in this curse, we'll definitely be pushing daisies soon. Can't let that happen. I've dallied on this long enough, left all my friends in harm's way after the warnings they've all given me. Besides, beneath the terror and the adrenaline that keeps me running, knowing what lies ahead for Isabella makes it hard not to take action. The paper sitting on the edge of the table calls my attention at this light against my hand when I reach for it. It has caught my eye the night before, but with the lot we still need to go through, I've simply ignored it. The logo emblazoned at the top of the page, however, provides this paper a whole new meaning. Not for me, but definitely for her. A scholarship grant, huh? I've only ever heard her talk about this once or twice, completing her degree, that is. She rarely goes about it in great detail, preferring to keep it to herself. Perhaps it's the fact that she thinks she's already too old to be chasing after it. Now, it's been five years, after all, but I've caught enough snippets of conversation between her and Zack to know she has never given up on it. Despite how things have panned out with her father, she's one step closer to this part of her life. As silly as this may sound, coming from a friend, I... I'd like to give her the chance to have this. Whether this means stepping out of my comfort zone and figuring what the deal with this curse is, I'll do so. If only to see that same smile in her, on her from that time again. These days, the only moments she seems to show it is when she's asleep, like right now, no matter how uncomfortable she appears. A smile of my own forms, despite this, when I glance at her sleeping form again. She hasn't moved since, her shoulders rising and falling in a slow, even rhythm with her breathing. You won't think she has any problems this way. If only that were true. <sighs> Sighing, I place the paper back where I've gotten it, carefully so I won't accidentally wrinkle or damage it in some way, and finally push myself off my makeshift bed. Isabella shifts when I carry her off from the floor and over to the, her bed, but doesn't wake. Simply tucks herself com comfortably under the covers I pull over her. Briefly, though, she mumbles something to herself and draws in another deep breath. Becca, Ashton's being dumb again. She drifts back to a deeper state of sleep after, like it hasn't been interrupted by the slightest movement earlier, but the small smile in her lips remain. One, I find myself returning in kind. Who sleeps like a rock now? It's better this way. Better to leave her to her dreams for the moment, which I hope are better than the ones I've had. She'll have time to worry about our problems later when she wakes up. For now, this will be another thing I don't want to take away from her. A moment of respite, no matter how fleeting. She deserves it. After everything she has been put through, what I've put her through. In the meantime, I still have two other people I need to check with. Isabella will definitely get in a tizzy if I don't check on them. Cold, Luxborn air meets me upon stepping out the hallway. Not unusual in itself, this is what Luxborn's weather is supposed to be. A bit cold, damp for the most part, and more often than not, terribly drab when an occasional sprinkling of rain every few hours. The sky is still clear, but I'll give it a day or two before the weather takes a turn for the worse. I've complained about the awful rains for years, despite having lived here my entire life. I have to admit, though, seeing it return to the... Oops. Seeing it return to the usual feels extremely reassuring. At least something's still normal in the world, when I can no longer think the same for the situation we're in. A nightmare. 
that's probably all this is. Usually, I'll say, I've been through worse. But that's simply another lie I've often told myself, isn't it? And I've fed myself a great deal of lies through the years, just so I won't have to think about it the next day. Maybe we won't even have this problem if I haven't been running away and ignoring things, hiding them someplace no one else will see, because I've since believed doing so is a show of weakness. The fuck do I know about ghosts, though? What is Zach? What is Rebecca? Z-Man has shown me photographs, mentioned weird things happening around him these past few days. Bottom line, he likely knows as much about this as I do. Why else would he approach me, the guy who knows stuff according to him? In the end, all I've done is give him the brush off some reliable guy I am. Hell, Rebecca's probably in the same boat, grasping for anything that might provide an answer, a way out of this. What can any of us do when all of us lacks any understanding of what's happening? One thing's clear about this, however, that thing is after us because... because of the letter. Both Rebecca and Zack have seen it, too. She will go after them as well. Yet here I am, walking up Becca's door one slow step at a time, a stalling tactic to allow myself some time to put the mess in my head in a better order. How to phrase this when there's a 90% chance she's still pissed about a whole different matter. It's the only reason why we didn't check on her last night, aside from the ungodly hour Isabel and I arrived. We'll only alarm her by showing up in her home in the middle of the night, acting like babbling lunatics, and her anger can last quite a while. These days, it seems the only one she can easily forgive is Isabella, but even with her, Becca's fuming still takes hours. I run my hand through my hair and straighten out my jacket before knocking, once, twice, and three times just to be sure she has heard me, even if she is asleep. She's usually awake by now, though. Hey, Becca, it's Ash. Open up. Don't tell me you're still in bed. Seconds tick by. No answer from her, and Dread has started to creep up. I've been trained to handle dire situations, but the feeling has been doing that quite frequently since last night. My mind begins to anticipate the worst, and in the next minute, concern has mixed in with my thoughts and I bang my fist on the door louder this time. She'll definitely be livid, but I'd rather face her wrath than a dead body. Becca! It's Ash! There's something we need to talk about right away! Open up, I know you're- Your girlfriend left early this morning, pretty boy. So, if you could do us a bloody favor and shut up, that'd be real fucking polite! My hand pauses short of landing another heavy knock. From the other unit, Rebecca's other neighbor peeks in through his door, though I see nothing but a bundle of blankets. I'll say they need help from being devoured by their sheets, but it sounds like he's just fine. He's a huge asshole, too. Course of action, so people like him won't ruin your day. Act like the nicest person on the planet. As I me wonders, when I was a rookie patrolling the streets, no need to match this his temper. Oh, did she say where she was going? Oh yeah, because she just says it to random people. I don't know. She said something about meeting someone or something, in case Filipina girl over there asks. But what am I, her keeper? You know, some people want to sleep in on a bloody Sunday, so keep it down. I was looking forward to this weekend. Thanks, you damn git. Well, there's no need to be an ass about it. I'll get out of your... He slams his door shut without warning, but not before muttering a string of very colorful words about me. Probably thinks I won't hear him inside the four walls of his apartment. Jerk. <sighs> and at the end of it, a sigh. So Rebecca's not here. I must have missed her by an hour or so, but at least she's not alone. She should be safe, in theory. More so if the person she's meeting with is who I think, uh, who I am thinking. Nevertheless, I still can't help but worry. It's an easy thing, continuing down... Increasingly darker lines of thought. Ah, I did it again. To act brashly, to find out where she is and go straight there without deliberating on my actions first. There's Zack to boot. Rebecca's not alone, but I can't say the same for the big guy. A simple phone call to the both of them should do the trick. It'll ease my nerves at any rate. It's better than rushing over to Zack's place or assuming Rebecca's whereabouts and finding out they're not where I've guessed they should be. Assuming the worst will come next, which I'd rather avoid this early, any other reason I won't bother them, but emergency begs for urgency. The urgency emergency. This is one, right? Even if it isn't, anxiety from concern dulls judgment, something I most certainly can't afford to lose at any given time, especially right now. Any means to calm it will do wonders for the muddled mess my mind is already in. Oh, uh, let's see. Who's Abigail, huh? 
Pulling up my phone, I thumb through the screen until it ends up on a group with only Zach, Rebecca's, and Isabel's numbers listed. Other people will probably say I keep too few friends when, the uh, when they chance on this. To some extent, it's true. I can easily name about a hundred people I've been acquainted with through the years. Colleagues, block mates from uni, uh, neighbors, those sorts of people. They all come and go. But these three... These three have chosen to stay for some reason, without wanting or asking for anything. Unlike the others, none has Zack's kindness, Rebecca's patience, nor the sincerity in Isabella's eyes. Uh, one day, these guys are just there. The next thing I know, being with them eases it. That heavy, somber feeling lingering in the air when you stand alone in your apartment, or something as simple as spending your day off without anyone. I'll say it's loneliness, but this carries much more depth than that. If I can help it... Is that smell? If I can... Oh god, someone's cooking meat. That means smoke alarm's gonna be going off soon. If I can help it, I don't want to lose any of them to some stupid curse. A phone call may be the la least comforting thing at the moment. You know, there's something wrong when you can't tell if it's someone cooking meat or a dirty cat box. Cat just used the cat box. Or... Someone's dog pooed in the house again. Honestly, I prefer being in the same room with them right now, but I'll, I'll take what I can get. Becca first. She did not want him taking that picture of her. <laughs> She'll get angry at me for worrying about her. She isn't some helpless damsel in distress after all. She isn't the shy little girl I knew when we were children. We're already far from the people we were back then. But that's more than enough reason to check in on her. I don't have to imagine her taking anything head-on. She'll do it instead of asking for help when she needs it. I don't care if she gets mad at me, if only to know that she's fine. A ring. In the silence of the hallway, it sounds alone. Might as well be sharp enough to pierce through my ears. Another second passes. Two. Three. But when, on the ninth ring, it goes straight to her voicemail, a cold feeling instantly lodges in my stomach. Probably just busy, that's all, though I still barely manage to keep my voice even when I speak. Hey, Becca, call me back when you're free. We need to talk. ASAP. Becca will be all right. She is all right. She's safe. She's with someone else. In the event that woman shows up, she'll have someone with her. Someone she'll be able to ask for help. She's safe. Damn it. Uh, she can handle herself. Becca might have a fiery temper, but she knows when she's faced with something she can't handle herself. Plus, she's Scottish. She falls upon that accent, and she, uh, runs fast. Rebecca will see my missed call, and she'll call me back. Though I don't express it enough, Rebecca is someone I consider important to me. Oh, what's this? She's been my friend for the longest. Anybody else would have been fed up with me and left. The girl stuck by me, no matter how big of a jerk I've been. There's Zack and Isabella now, too, of course. I'll always be thankful for having them around. The worst times before, however, Becca was there. No one believes it when I say it, but I've surely had my awful moments as a bratty kid and as a horrible teen. Issues. I have too many of them to count and refuse to deal with for a time. At least that's what Andrew likes to tell me. I tend to think nothing of it. It has mellowed down over the years, and thanks to the professor mostly. But at times, I do wonder if it still burdens me the way it did all those years ago. After all, I was terrible, especially around the time of my parents' separation. Looking back at it now, I had no reason to direct all my frustration towards everyone else. While I wasn't a kid who lashed out at anyone, preferring to keep it to myself and turning those negative feelings into more productive things, I've grown distant from a lot of people because of it. From my old friends back in my old school and the neighbors I've hung out with before moving. A habit I've likely brought with me into adulthood. It was just so... angry with everyone and everything. All I kept thinking about was myself wondering, why me? In retrospect, I was a selfish little bastard who thought the world re revolved around me. That I shouldn't have been going through it, I believed my behavior was entitled, that I had the right. Tough times, but she stuck with me. Stat snapped me out of my little sulk, as she often phrases it, whenever she sees the chance to bring it up. 
She didn't tolerate my bullshit, but she didn't leave me alone either. If anything, the whole thing made her stick around. My, her concern may have grown a bit overbearing as the years went by, but she's still an old friend, nevertheless. I owe her a lot. That won't change. Damn it. Where are you, Becca? Another message left on her voicemail, then my third call, I hang up. For the time being, I can't do anything more than to wait for her to return my calls. Worrying aimlessly won't get me anywhere. Zack, on the other hand... That guy attracts trouble no matter how much he tries to avoid it. Doesn't help how he has been too hot lately with a lot of people. Hasn't been too hot lately with a lot of- what does that mean? His mention of plans yesterday doesn't set too well with me either. He might be the next responsible adult after Rebecca, out of the four of us, but I've still got to check on the big guy. Make sure he's doing okay at the very least, whatever he has planned on doing. All I'm asking for is for it not to be idiotic. He's a sensible guy, I'm sure. However, desperation clings and pushes people to do things, rational or irrational, it doesn't matter. Clear thinking flies out the window the moment you're in danger, and I sincerely hope he has not found himself in a tricky situation, like breaking into a mansion. His phone doesn't even ring before he answers, or his voicemail at least. Hey, it's Zach. Well, a voicemail anyway. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So, uh, just leave a message, yeah? And no, Ash, you're not allowed to lockpick your way into my apartment again. Just do what any other decent human being does and call if I'm not around. Thanks. Did he turn it off? Why? I don't want to assume the worst yet. Maybe he has forgotten to charge it? Can't be. The guy can be a bit of a boy scout even more than I am as a cop. He's the type who has an extra battery or a power bank in his bag if he ever needs it. And he always does. He won't say anything or brag about it, but he's got quite a roster of VIP freelance clients. He won't just leave his phone dead in case he's on the field, particularly when people will likely be looking for him. He always leaves his connection open whenever clients or his friends need him. Zack is reliable like that. Why isn't anyone answering? His mobile is an out of range area sounds more uh his mobile in an out of range area sounds more plausible, although the thought of it doesn't completely shake off the unease. Unlike Rebecca and I, he took the time to listen to what Isabel has said. And even if he didn't believe it, he was definitely the first one to offer help or try to do something. If he ends up uh, if he ends up in trouble doing whatever it is, so help me, I'm going to Well, I can't be rash, I'm aware of that. Been running the same reminder in my head since last night. But if something happens, I'm certain my reaction won't be pretty. The added guilt from those times I've repeatedly dismissed him will surely haunt me. Yo, Zach, call me back, all right? I wanted to check in and, uh, yeah, just please call me back. It's usually a joke between us when I say he's the Watson to my Sherlock. I don't see him as some assistant to put aside until he's needed, like some people like to believe, though. He's not some pity friend I keep around to make myself look good. If anything, he's the one who stayed by me out of pity. Zack's the one who pits up with me most of the time, even when he doesn't need to. It's not a case of a cool cop who helped out a minority. In truth, I was a hard-headed, hot-tempered, and reckless rookie up until I met him. It wasn't anything sudden, and some part of me is still that rookie. But I've grown, thanks to him. He tempers that part of me. Considering how our first impressions went, I'm lucky he stuck around. Becca and I may have spent a lot of years together as children, but Zack, he's... He's probably the closest thing I'll call to a best friend, though it's more than that. A camaraderie no words can express. He has my back and I'll always have his. He's a brother I've never had the luck of ever having. Only child and all. And I have every reason to worry about my brother. <laughs> Becca's neighbor did say she went out to meet with someone, no specific names. If I'm wrong and she's not with Professor Clark, then maybe it's with Zack. They've never been close, but it's not the kind of awkward friendship where meeting together remains out of the question. Regardless, I continue dialing for his phone another three times, like I've done with Rebecca's. In the end, after the third attempt with no one answering, I stop and move to cut the call with a ragged exhale. Waiting game it is, then. I've been trained for those. Hell, I'm used to them. Just, just not when it comes to people I'm close to. Much as I keep reminding myself to maintain a level head, it's a whole different matter when it's someone you know. Personal feelings will likely get involved at some point. It's starting now, actually, with the anxious strings coiling and uncoiling, causing a racket inside my stomach. And that's exactly when the line finally connects. 
Before he even speaks, my question has already slipped out, including every pent-up worry and tension in my body. Where are you? The line's choppy, though I can still make out the words he's saying. Nothing to worry about, then. He's just someplace where network coverage is shitty. Can't imagine where at this time of the morning, though. Did he go out for a jog? What was that, Ash? Could you repeat that? Signal shitty here. I asked, where are you? Hell, Zach, I've been calling your number for a good 20 minutes now. What kind of shithole did you get into? I meant that to sound as friendly as possible to keep things light, at least. Instead, the only, only the frustration shows in my tone. Good morning to you, too. I should be asking you that question. I've been looking all over the mansion for you. Oh, shit. I thought you'd be... What mansion? Do I really need to answer that? Why are you even... Please, don't tell me that's his plan. A morning visit to the mansion where Luke Wright is? Of all the pig-headed things to do right now, it's the best thing he can come up with? Breaking and entering as a minority? Uh, I've got plenty of reasons to rail at him right now, although no matter how much I want to give him a piece of my mind, unfortunately, it's not the time. No. No, wait. Just get your ass to Isabella's place and hurry. He pauses a moment, a second of indecision while he seems to contemplate his options. How urgent is this? In truth, the question, the hesitance and the indecision in his voice has caught me completely off guard, and understanding dawns on me. His decision to go there isn't one born out of a stupid impulse, he must have found something. However, no matter how urgent it is, he still shouldn't have gone there, alone at that. Despite myself in that split second of comprehension, I allow it to show a weakness. A simple request brimming with every unease and disquiet causing turmoil within me since last night. It bears a selfish hope that he'll understand even through the unstable signal that whatever's keeping him there, he'll be willing to set it aside for now. Pressing enough for you to stop asking questions and get yourself here. Please, Zack. Silence fills the other end of the line again. For a long moment, I assume he won't heed it, and I'll have to drive there myself just to drag him away from whatever danger he's skirting. Thankfully, he agrees. I'll be there in a few. An hour or two tops. Thanks. I'll see you. Relief washes over me as soon as the call ends. Normally, I don't let myself a moment of respite in times like this. Gotta stay alert. Rebecca's still out there, has yet to return any of my messages. But for the moment, I relish in it. This is probably the first time I've permitted myself to do so since last night. Even the muscles in my shoulders have been complaining from all the tension I've taken on. It still annoys me that all I can do right now is grit my teeth and trudge back to Isabella's apartment. Useless. That's what I am in the face of this. A mad dash around Luxbourne and Anselm isn't going to help things. It's not like I'll simply stumble across them on the side of the road during a drive. The city's too big a place for one person to go searching for only two people. I'll be lucky if I even glimpse the hair of either of them. Uh, with one last hopeful glance towards the open skies, I slip back into Isabel's apartment and close the door behind me. I might have already grown used to this, but the waiting will always, always be the hardest part, more so when it's the people you care about. You're up early. I thought you left. This is not the first time I've seen Isabel like this in her underwear. Standing casually by her kitchenette, a ladle in hand, keeping an eye on whatever's doing on the stove, while humming a soft tune under her breath. Five years ago, it has become a common sight after the three of them, including Zack and Rebecca, found a mutual trust interest in cooking. After that, whenever our schedule allows it, one of them will invite everyone to dinner or lunch instead of eating out. Rebecca prefers it that way, healthier, she claims. Zack's just too happy to be able to cook for everyone. Isabella, on the other hand, as long as there's food, she's happy. Me, I've been banned from the kitchen ever since the pressure cooker incident. Easier times, good times. Right now, however, the scene brings an odd sense of normalcy, a strange fit with all of the things going on around us. Not unwelcome, only bizarre, I suppose. Isabella doesn't follow up on her question I earlier, but she does raise an eyebrow my way when I take too long to answer. For that, I only offer a casual shrug in response and a short answer. I've checked with Zack and Rebecca. I'm just waiting to hear back from them. I'll add in a quip or two for her. Uh, if the timing for a joke isn't off, we're doing so won't be inappropriate. I don't want to alarm her either. There's no reason to yet. Until Zack gets here, or until I've received an answer from Rebecca, whichever comes first. Nevertheless, it's clear she has plenty of questions. It's right there in the subtle crease between her eyebrows and the inquisitive gleam in her eyes. 
curious as she is, though, she decides against voicing all of her questions out. Instead, she shifts her attention back to the stove and gestures vaguely with her hand in the couch's direction. Well, if we're going to wait for them, don't stand around there. It's getting distracting. Hey, Bidadua. You're just cooking. How am I distracting? I don't know. Something might explode again, maybe. Zach's kitchen ban for you is also in effect here, you know. Now, Shu, go. Stop hovering. You'll ruin the food. I'll be done here soon. She leaves no room for an argument by swatting the ladle at me, and just like that, I have been kicked out of the kitchen. Left with nothing else to do, I drift back to her tiny living space and slump down on the couch. Closing my eyes, I allow the noise from the television to guide my thoughts. The ones I've been keeping at bay, freeing from the cage I've built around them, so I won't have to think. One by one, they trickle back into my consciousness, each more frightening and unnerving than the other. So many things going on. So many things happening. The papers we've gotten from BRC doesn't provide any comfort either. Seriously, is there even a point to those after last night? What will asking those people do? If anything, the, uh, this only proved there might be more copies of that dumb piece of paper. We have one here, but how many exactly is there out there? More importantly, how do we get out of this stupid mess? Ashton. Damn it, I haven't felt this kind of bone-weary exhaustion in years. I don't want to think what might happen next in case I miss something. Shit. Rebecca. Zach. Isabella. They're all depending on me, and... Ash! The voice snaps me out of my thoughts, abruptly wiping away everything running a racket inside my head. Suddenly, Isabella is there, crouched in front of me when I crack my eye open. I haven't even noticed the exact moment when I've bent over and buried my head in my hands. Figures why she's staring at me like I've fainted or something. Crease on her eyebrows grow deeper at my lack of response. Although she's merely staring at me without saying a word, her expression says everything. So much for trying not to alarm her with bad news. Sorry, I just spaced out for a moment. Don't mind me. For a brief moment, she seems to accept that. Quietly, she shifts, stands up, and takes the empty space right beside me. All done without a single comment, then the next thing I know, she's gently pushing a bowl in my hands. The scent reaches me first before I've gotten the chance to take in what she has just handed me. A faint, sweet smell of cocoa wafts from the dish. Calming, comforting, despite the multitude of things bothering me, it certainly smells like the kind of food you'll eat on a rainy day. Though from the get-go, it doesn't look as appetizing. What is this even? Porridge? Why would you put chocolate in it and milk drizzled on top? My gods. She tells me my tastes are weird, yet here she is, handing me something equally as strange. In fact, she has already started digging into hers. I'm just not sure if the taste will be equally as appealing. Baffled, I glance her way. She offers no immediate answer, simply continues eating as if she hasn't done so in a week, with her focus solely on the television. She's not watching, however, just listening. As background noise, the voices from it seems too cheerful. A welcome distraction, if anything. Oh, my. Oh. Uh, it's only after she has finished off half the bowl does she acknowledge the question in my eyes. The sigh, she cradles the dish on her lap and looks down at it. Briefly, her lips part, then closes, a hesitation, though I don't push her. There's a distant air on her, as if she has remembered something that warrants a poignant thought. When she speaks at last, it's in a tone too careful, like she's still weighing her words, considering the proper phrasing for it to explain what this atrocity of a dish is. <laughs> Yet sincerity underlies each syllable once they're out in the open. You should eat. Back at home, Mom would never let us leave the house if we hadn't eaten breakfast yet. Even Papa has got an earful when he tried. So eat. You'll need it. Yes, but what is this monstrosity? She returns to her food afterwards. While I can only stare at the one she has proffered not a few minutes ago. Warm against my hands, tempting me to take a bite. Not that I don't appreciate this, but what good will this do? Zack and Rebecca's both out there. Who knows when that ghost will show up again? And in the meantime, what is this thing? Even in our dreams, we're not safe. I really want to know what that food is. But that's it, isn't it? We don't know when, and at present, we have a chance at respite. Maybe the only one we'll have. 
even if it says mundane, a sharing food between us, quietly just sitting side by side like this without ex exchanging any words. The intent hangs unspoken in the air, something that probably goes as far back as the second she offered food. Still, in the end, Isabella's never push never pushes it, rather she lets her own silence convey her hope. Uh, whether I'll allow myself that break, uh, she leaves it up to me. Yeah, I'll take it. Thank you. Why not? Why be rude? I mean, look at that. The words roll off my tongue, awkward and unfamiliar, far removed from those jests and quips we've shared. Yet she accepts this with a smile and nothing more. Regardless of everything left unsaid, the sight of it brings comfort. More so than any generous offer of food can give. Though we both lapse into silence after, as we finish our food, there's ease in it, in this, in the muffled sounds of Luxborn filtering into the room, and the light streaming from her windows and the faint draft occasionally drifting in, catching the loose tendrils of her hair, and the way her voice falters when she tries to form words to explain what this food is. And despite the horror looming, looming over us, I find myself wishing for the minutes to slow, for the seconds to last. But ultimately, she's the one who breaks it, softly after a minute's pause and words mumbled under her breath. Sometimes, silence simply compels us to speak. I've been wondering, you know, before last night, before Mama told me the news, what if... what if Papa passes away, despite everything? That sort of thing. I know it's not good to think about, but... She gonna say but? I also knew it was getting worse. Mama won't say anything, but... I've always known that one day, he'll eventually... It's a branching tree? Oh, I can't. Okay, never mind. She releases a sigh as her grip on the bowl she still holds tightens. There are no tears, but she might as well have them with how weak her voice falls. Are there even any left? I don't know what I'm going to do. Before... I can easily say it's because of Papa. Now... I don't have anything. You have that scholarship from Luxu. Were you going through my personal papers while I was sleeping last night? I don't really have to. You left it sitting in the open, right there on the table. Like there's still anything to hide, she snatches it away where I placed it back earlier. Except there's no anger or annoyance in her face when she looks at it and rereads every line with a pensive expression. After a short while, she folds it neatly along the creases and sets it back. I don't even know if this will work out. Well, if it doesn't, what about that exhibit you've been planning with Zack? Do I even have to ask where you got that? Zack sucks at lying. You have no idea how easy he is to read. It was all in his face when I asked about it. And anyway, if that doesn't pan out too... I trail off, hesitating, measuring the weight of my next words. Genuine as they are, a part of me believes they're a burden too heavy to impose upon her. Because no matter how much I want her to stay, we are not what ties her here. It'll be selfish to ask that of her. More than anything, her family will always come first. I say it, nevertheless, if only to let her know that no matter what her choice will be, there will be people here whose lives her mere presence has changed. Mine, most of all. You. You have us. The words startle her to a pause and cease that music. <laughs> And slowly, she turns to me, her eyes wide, disb disbelief all over her face. But before regret forces an apology up my throat, her expression dissolves into something I can't quite place. Something distinctly softer, more tender, familiar, almost in the same manner she glanced at me years ago that day at the bridge. However, I don't get the chance to figure out what it all means for her. All of a sudden, a knock breaks the moment, and just as fast, both her attention shifts towards the source. Before things can get awkward fast, I stand up to open the door while muttering some flimsy excuse in the process. Uh, I'll get that. It's probably Zach or Rebecca. Really, I know we're in a pinch, but their timing can't get any worse. Unrelated frustrations aside, once I fling the door open, a whole chunk of the stone that has been stuck at the pit of my stomach simultaneously unseats itself. There in the hallway stands Zach, his hand raised ready for another knock. Although he's not at his most presentable at the moment, ruffled and drenched with sweat as he is, relief quickly washes over me like a tide. 
He's still panting when he pushes me aside and heads in. The second his feet crosses the threshold, he scans the place, eyeing what little he can see of the room from the doorway. When he finds none of whatever he's looking for, he turns to me with a questioning look, one that has a hint of panic in it. You said it was urgent. Did anything happen? Is it Becca? Bella? Everyone's fine. Well, Becca's not here. She went somewhere this morning and hasn't answered any of my calls yet. But Isabella's... I'm here, Zach. Morning. He shifts. His weight shifts at the same time. The stiff line in his shoulders eases. Once Isabella walks up to us and welc welcomes him with a smile. He relaxes then, returns her greeting in kind as soon as he has let out the breath that, has, uh, that he has been holding. And the tension's finally off his body. So, nothing's wrong? Why'd you call me here for then? My explanation can wait. He has a lot of explaining to do. The fact that he went to Anselm alone for some godforsaken reason warrants a proper one. Ghosts or not, he's already been given a warning. It frustrates me to no end this might be the plan he mentioned the last time we spoke. I get that he's worried about Hannah Wright. Somehow they've become friends, but that's not the issue here. Not when there's a murderous ghost who might go after one of us at any given time. Sure, Zack made it here in one piece. By some dumb luck, he's alright, and this takes one off the list of people I need to worry about. Frankly, as annoyed as I am, I can't just stay angry at him when I look at the situation that way. Hell, if that call didn't connect in that exact minute, there might have been a chance he won't be standing here. If I had made an even worse decision and sent him in, this is a blessing in itself. Though, first things first, some things still need to be discussed. And next time, we shall see how it goes. Can I? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe Ashton's chapter might be over soon. Who knows? <laughs>